Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Elna Rafan Alanu. We begin this teaching with a fervent prayer that healing will be brought soon to our world as the struggle against the coronavirus escalates. We pray for the wisdom of our scientists. We pray for the thoughtful and compassionate and honest guidance of those who are our elected leaders. We pray that we, each of us, can find a reasoned path between panic and indifference. We pray that our personal identity with the human community will cause us to act with care and concern for the well-being of others. And we pray for those who are already infected that they will be blessed with a speedy healing. Rafa'inu v'nei rafa, heal us, O God, and we shall be healed. Recently, many of us have been especially conscious of a variety of calendar dates. March 2nd, remember that? That was the third and perhaps not final round of Israeli national elections. Then there was March 3rd, Super Tuesday, and the subsequent radical reshaping of the American presidential campaign. And coming up, March 11th, the final day of voting for the World Zionist Congress. Oh, and with regard to March 11th, it just occurred to me out of the air. Yes, I am running on slate number two, the slate of the Association of Reform Zionists of America, ARTSA, the only slate whose platform calls for the establishment of religious pluralism in Israel. And yes, this has been a shamelessly self-serving request for you to go to azm.org on your phones, register, pay the minimal service charge, and vote for Artsa, Religious Pluralism in Israel, and Stanley Davids. Oh, no. Okay. But wait, let's go back for a moment to March 3rd. March 3rd is labeled in the Hebrew calendar this year as the seventh day of the month of Adar. And what happened on the seventh day of the month of Adar? Right, it's the assigned death date of Moses. Now let's just see how Rabbi Sachs connects the seventh of Adar to our Sedra, which is Titzaveh, Exodus 27, verse 20 and following. Now, Titzaveh is the only Sedra between the time that Moses' birth is described in the book of Exodus until the end of the book of Numbers where Moses is not mentioned. This Sedra between the beginning of Exodus the end of Numbers, this is the only one in which Moses is not at all mentioned. And the rabbis would say, maybe that's so because it's an expression of mourning and respect for Moses. Instead of invoking Moses, our sedra, Titzaveh, is all about the ritual clothing and obligations of the Kohanim, the priests. Moses was a prophet. Moses was, in fact, the prophet. Lokambi Israel Kamoshe Od, no one has ever achieved the unique status of Moses among our people. Navi Umabit et Tmunato, he was a prophet who actually viewed the image of God. Aaron, Aaron was the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, he was the high priest who received God's instructions through the Urim and Tumim, those were the sacred dice that were placed within the Choshen Mishpat, the uh, breast piece of decision worn over the high priest's heart. So Rabbi Dr. Jacobs asks us to explore the differences now brought to us by this sedra and the absence of the mention of Moses, the differences between prophet and priest. I need your help here. What words come to mind when I say the phrase high priest. 
Think about it. What associations do you have? Enough. Purity, impurity, sacrifice, forgiveness, sacred, secular, separations, distinctions, holy, unholy. What comes to mind when I mention the word prophet? He's a prophet. What words come to mind? Talks with God, rebukes, warns, challenges, angry, suffers. How does a priest get to be a priest? It's dynastic. The priest's sons are priests. Painfully, biblical law pays little or no heed to the benot kohen, the daughters of a kohen. The boys got dad's job. Now, how does a prophet become a prophet? If you would have asked Jeremiah, he would have grimaced and said, may I, may I, my, my innards are inflamed by a message that I have no choice but to deliver. He's overcome by a message that causes him pain to share. Prophets had no choice but to be prophets. The prophets embraced tzedek, righteousness, mishpat, justice, emet, truth, shalom, peace, ava, love, breed, covenant. A prophet was one of the people. The prophet was called. The prophet had no fine ceremonial clothing, no golden bells or fancy turbans. Even when the prophet was descended from priestly lineage, the prophet found it incredibly difficult to be seen as a member of the ruling class because very often the prophet was directly challenging the values and the behaviors of the ruling class. That's a side comment. I must suggest that anyone who is really interested in penetrating the life and the vocation of the prophets should turn to the magisterial book, The Prophets, written by Abraham Joshua Heschel. That book stands alone and apart in its wisdom. The prophets. Unbelievable. The priests were to be honored. Prophets were often scorned, ignored, imprisoned, or even killed. Priests lived a life of cyclical rituals. Oh, it's Passover. Time to line up the Passover sacrifices and so forth. Prophets, not so much. They responded to the pain, the challenges, the drama, the demands of a given time. I love here Rabbi Sachs's phrasing, the prophets responded to history and not to the seasons. I like that. But what comes next was somewhat of a surprise for me. Sachs references our center to emphasize his praise for the priests. Sachs writes, For whereas Moses lit the fire in the soul of the Jewish people, Aaron tended the flame and turned it into an eternal light. Sachs describes us in our essence as a priestly people. He sees daily ritual and daily deeds as critically important to our identity. We're called to be a holy people, and we find our holiness through worship, through serious and committed Torah study, through seeking to connect with God three times a day, every day. Of course, Sachs, of course, the prophet is critically important to lift us toward history. But the priest, Sachs, is critically important to lift us toward God. Daily worship is the Jewish people's living connection with God. Rarely do I find myself in what I fear is a serious disagreement with Rabbi Dr. Lord Sachs' teachings. But I... I'm uncomfortable with how Sachs sets up a binary choice, priest, prophet, and then tries to force us to embrace his singular, single preference, priests. There are actually three, three sources of leadership within Jewish tradition, priest, prophet, king. Each has its realm, each has its benefits, each has its dangers, but all three, all three, are critically important 
indispensable. Secular leadership provides order, administers justice, creates protection for the weak, defends against external threats, sense of vision of where the political realm wishes to go. Secular leaders. Religious leaders celebrate aspirational values, create pathways to link the finite and the infinite, offer healing and hope and consolation, sanctify life cycles, create communities of meaning, and bring light where there is darkness. Prophets call us to account, shake our complacency, demand justice and mercy, stir our souls, and lift us toward our better selves. We cannot survive without secular leadership. We cannot survive without ways to bring holiness into our daily lives. And we cannot survive without those who shake us out of our complacency and demand more from us. Bottom line, we need to choose our political leaders carefully. We have to embrace the noblest religious leaders who must live by the values they teach. And we must play, cl pay close heed to those who will not allow us to luxuriate in our complacency. That's it for this week. It's Purim, another date, Monday evening. Have a wonderful Purim. Let's choose all three kinds of leaders very carefully in the weeks, months that lie ahead. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom.